about ticks and ticks, tick-borne diseases. Uh, I know that the most prevalent tick species here in Estonia as well is Ixodes vicinus. And uh, uh, I've made these maps, but, and I wasn't 100% about Dermacentor. So do you have Dermacentor? Do you have Babesia cases in Estonia? Okay. Slowly imported. Okay, imported. Yeah, not like if the dog had been somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But this somewhere is already quite close because yeah, Lati yeah. is full of it. Uh, don't have this is from here and you have cases, so. Okay. Last year we sold like okay. 1,000. It's always is very important for us. Derma Center, I believe that it is spreading towards north when the climate is getting warmer and warmer. It has a very high demand for, for moisture as well. It is very similar to Ixodes, so so it will probably it will be in our country in the near future, I would say. Uh, have you diagnosed this one in Estonia? It's funny that it is a Mediterranean species, as you can see, it's the most prevalent there. It is a very very well tolerated draft, so it, it doesn't uh, bother it if, if, if there is dry around. But, uh, Okay, we have it in imported dogs, but we have our own Ripicephalus in our country as well. And we will discuss about it a little bit. There's a high risk to have it in our countries as well. Okay, but this is uh, by, by far the most important species. It is in literature referred quite often as a custodian tick or sheep tick. Uh, uh, in fish, do you have, by the way, uh, the tick species of Ixodes persulcasus. It, it is uh, a Siberian or, or Russian species originally, but I, did, I don't have a map here, but, but we have a sort of, it is from Russia, uh, and it is in the middle part of Finland where we have a very really narrow, narrow channel where we have Ixodes persulcasus. Uh, why we encourage, I mean, of course, you have to be a specialist to say that this is Ixodes ricinus and this is Ixodes cursul cut. But it was uh, our, our virologist who figured out that because at that certain geographical part of Finland, we have this, uh, okay, we have tick-borne encephalitis, but the na nastier version, so having more severe clinical disease. So, and, and they found that it is this type of disease is more typical for this uh, Russian type of tick or encephalitis, and it is usually spread by another species of ticks than, than Ixodes ricinus. So they started to collect the ticks from that region and they found that it is Ixodes ricinus. Okay. But what is uh, really typical for it is it is. Uh, found mainly in the uh, area of uh, rough grazing, moorland and woodland. I think that blueberry forests are very typical <coughs> sites nowadays. When I was younger in Finland, blueberry forests were safe. I mean, you didn't see ticks over there, but now they are there. And I mean, you, you can really easily get the infestation over there. But it's very typical that it, 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 the species has really high demand for humidity. And I mean, if you have 80% uh, of, of uh, how do you call it, uh, this, this moist, moist, moisture percentage, of, anyway, do you, do you know what I mean? So if you, uh, then it's not neither losing or gaining water. So if it's 80%, it's okay for mixers. If it's less, it is already a little bit harsh on this. And that's why if you have a really dry land, uh, then, then you won't get it. But this kind of habit is very typical. This is from coastal region. And, uh, and at that summer, I didn't put any tick protection product on my dogs. And I have to pick over 30 ticks from here every day when I went and we went into the forest with the dogs. It was really terrible. And there was no electric. Electricity, so I did, did it in the candle light, so probably <laughs> there was a high probability that, that, that I left some ticks with probably carrying some tick-borne diseases on the skin. But this high humidity is re really important, and you can really see that 
that in the real life as well. That if you have a dry summer, it is so that the, the ticks sort of disappear during the dry period and then they come back when the uh, rain starts, starts again. So it is it's really typical for them. Somebody believes that there are sort of two generations, but they are the same ticks usually. Okay, now they are active when the temperature is going uh, over plus 5, so probably you have already seen some of this <coughs> this spring, we've got them really early in Finland as well. A life cycle is usually 2 to 3 years, so because it, uh, the each stage it, it demands a blood meal before to, to mold into the next stage, and uh, because we have this winter time, so it's quite often that only one stage can be, uh, let's say, <coughs> One stage during one summer, and then there's winter between, and then the next stage. So that's why it's quite often that they are three years old. Okay, <coughs> temporary parasites. Uh, only two percent of the lifetime is spent as a parasite, so it's, uh, everybody knows about that. And it's <coughs> rather easy to recognize which one are females and which are males, uh, and it's based on this this kitten shield covering the dorsum. What is this part could do? And this is typical female because the, the back part of the, the female is this lighter greenish gray, and, and uh, the male is entirely this coffee colored and uh, covered with this thick kitty shield. Okay, uh, they are spending a lot of time in the grass and, uh, and they are sort of praying for the host. Uh, they have these howler organs as well. They are located about here, uh, oh, sorry, here. And this is a typical position for them to have the, the hind legs a little bit upwards and collecting the information about uh, what is happening in the surroundings. And they are able to detect a lot of things. So some of them, they have eyes. Each of the three seniors doesn't have eyes. But, but they are still able to, to detect some, fly, some light. Uh, if somebody is touching them, they will recognize that then they are measuring a butyric acid and lactic acid from the hosts. Uh, if there's something appears, uh, the changes in temperature are measured, vibration, and they are even, even to, able to detect some frequencies of sound. For example, this ripicephalus brown dog is it is loves dogs. It is really how, uh, dog specific. It, 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 it can choose, so it's able to recognize the voices of dogs. And then there are some other species that are typical for ruminants, and they are able to recognize the sounds by ruminants. So it's really fascinating somehow. Okay, the ox uh, oxygen uptake it is from this side called spiracles, so it's like a sieve-like uh, structures and they are folded uh, surface underneath of this sieve-like structure and there is the, the, the transportation of the, of the oxygen and, and uh, carbon dioxide. Then the mouth parts, uh, we will have another photo about it, and this is this Haller's organ, so the important uh, organs uh, serving as an antenna for, for spider and arachnids. Okay, first phase, they will find a host and uh, its attachment. And it will penetrate the skin with the aid of the cutting uh, mouth parts and then the, it, has, it is excreting lytic substances. And this part is called hypostomum, and as you can see, there are back backwards directed kitino spikes over there. And uh, when the tick is really penetrating the skin, it is at the same time it's excreting, excreting the substance called as a cement-like substance, and that it, it is hardening immediately. So it's going to be really, really, really tight hold fast on the skin all the time. And when it has uh, recently attached on the skin, it's very difficult for the, uh, for the tick as well to, re uh, to, to detach. I mean, it, if, if it wants to detach, it's impossible for it. Because of these bites, before, because of uh, 
the local swelling of the skin and because of this cement-like substance excreted by the tick. So, I mean, there are still uh, dog owners and uh, uh, tick haters who, uh, who, let's say, the, the treatment of uh, choice would be the, to suffocate the tick. And I mean, if you are really trying to suffocate the tick, you should cover all these holes here. Uh, not here, because it's not breathing from its mouth. Breathing occurs here. But anyway, if it's recently attached to the skin, it's impossible for the tick to get, uh, let's say, to be that skin. Okay, if you are able to cover all these holes, actually the oxygen uptake of uh, by ticks is very really low, so the demand for oxygen is not that high. But of course, I mean, if you are using all, all kind of uh, things that you have, other, at the end of the day, it will suffocate. But it's not going to detach by itself, it's going to detach because it's going to die, and it will uh, uh, lose the all the moisture, so it's shrinking and then it's detaching because of that. And of course there is a high, high risk that, that if you try to suffocate it, that at that time there are a time for tick-borne diseases to transmit from the tick into the skin. So, don't do that. Uh, what is typical uh, as well is that during the first few days, uh, the tick is really preparing for the blood, blood, blood meal. So it will take a couple of days before it starts engorgement. And en engorgement is really that it will be uh, bloody, uh, uh, filled with blood. And, but that will happen not immediately after a couple of days. So that's typical, this preparation period. Okay, so it's introducing the mouthpiece in the skin, and there's a, there's a pool uh, forming a little bit, and then uh, uh, during this <coughs> sucking, the tick will change the, the structure of, and the content of salivary glands, and that has some impact on the skin as well. So, I mean, of course, the host of the dog or human being, whoever is here, uh, it will, the immune system will notice that something, has, something is happening here, that there is mouth past introduced here. And uh, this is okay for tick as well. They are excreting uh, substances that are really uh, have efficacy against uh, the immune system of the host. But anyway, uh, at the end of the blood sucking period, they are changing the salivary content. So what will happen that you will have a sort of abscess here. So there will be leukocytes and, and other inflammatory cells. And what is typical for abscess? So that the, the, part, the skin covering the abscess is getting thinner and thinner. And by the end, usually about seven days after the attachment, there is always a well-developed small abscess and the skin is very thin and it's easy for teeth to detach and start laying eggs. And then probably if you have performed any tick picking, you have noticed that those engorged blood field ticks are much easier to remove than recently attached. And that is the reason for that. Okay, here's a female. Uh, the male doesn't have a blood meal. There is, um, it's really difficult to find the information, but, but uh, I have had that feeling all the time, and then uh, I, I discussed with our R&D people in, in, in Germany, Schwabenheim, when they performed these product studies, they had artificial, artificial uh, infestations, and they were dealing with thousands and thousands of ticks, and they introduced males and females, and they said that we have never seen a male. But there are tick species where both sexes are plus but in Ixodes, residues, no. Okay, the female is secreting pheromones, and the male's job is really to find the female. And I mean, if you, if you uh, find a tick on your skin, or feel that there is a tick, something walking, it's quite often the male. Because female, it's, it, all it needs is a, is a vein to start sucking, and that's it. But the male, male is when it is on your skin, it has to find the female somewhere. So it is walking around on your skin, so and that will be and it will be noted much more easily than the female. And uh, if you 
uh, detach this engorged or female, quite often you will find the male attacks on the ventral surface of the skin. And it's really the male, because there are, a couple of years ago there was a dog book in Finland, it's not really, was really, really not for veterinarians, but the dog owners about, about let's say, general care of dogs. And there was a story about ticks that you should be extra careful when you, when you detach uh, this tick because it is quite easily giving birth for smaller ticks and, and they will start blood stuffing. And okay, that was a sort of observation but misinterpretation of the observation. Because it can happen. What, this, is a, this is a child, like on the bed? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that was considered. And, and you, it can happen, of course, that, because this is mating, but uh, the, the rest of the males don't know that there is still already this one. The lucky one is here. So they can be frustrated males around the female. So you, will, you might get a sort of uh, it's impression that this is a mother and the kids. <laughs> and that's not really the case. Okay, after mating, after the blood sucking, encouragement, seven days, the female will detach and it will lay eggs, and the thousands of eggs. And it's usually, uh, again, the moisture is very important, so it is that, uh, that happening on the ground. Uh, that's happened in my refrigerator. So uh, this is uh, the situation in, in November. So female is there, and you, you can see that it, see, it's not really good looking anymore. But it's still alive, because it's cleaning the eggs, and, and, and I know uh, there must be some antibiotics on the eggs as well, because the, the, I mean, these are doing very well. And as you can see, there are some evidence that, that there are some of the eggs are hatching already. Okay, and you all know that that for some of the microbes it's possible to to transmit from the from the female tick to the eggs, so the disease is already there. But fortunately, there are not too many of those diseases. Okay, the life cycle. Female laid eggs, and next uh, usually next spring, early spring, the larvae will be there and they eat a black meal. And usually they prefer rodents and birds and this kind of thing. Okay, what is unfortunate that that for example Borrelia is pretty often and prevalent in those small rodents. So usually the Borrelia inf infection is collected during these phases. So then when it is time for human being or the dog the pig was infested. Okay, and then after the blood meal, it will detach and it will uh, molt, and there will be a nymphal stage. A nymphal stage need another blood meal, and again, when, when you got it, then next spring, the adults will be the females and males. And again, the female need a blood meal uh, and mating in order to produce eggs. I mean, if this tick here, for example, if this nymphal stage, if it's unlucky, I mean, it has been there for, for one summer, and nobody is really walking by. So next, it will go down, and it will overwinter there. And next spring, it's again an enforced state. So if he, if it's a, if he decides that I would like to be forever a young tick, then avoid blood meals, and, and, and we can be an enforced state for, for many, many years. It's really needed. And what is happening then, I mean, uh, this is a typical situation and uh, when it is a dry period, they are going down and spending here many, many, usually many, many weeks and then when it's moisture, enough moisture, then they will start this draining again. <coughs> uh, this uh, the spring, what we had this, Robert, you had this warm sea, uh, period as well and now it got cold again. Uh, it, can be really harmful for these larval stages because they have very thin keeping layer covering them and now they thought that now it's summer because it was past 15 at least in Helsinki two weeks ago so they woke up and they started to prey 
for the blood meal, but then now it suddenly got colder, so they, most of them died. Okay, we will see then the, <coughs> the let's say the, what the impact after a couple of years because because we are our dogs and ourselves we are already attacked by these stages rather than this larval stage. <coughs> Okay, here is the whole family, female, as you can see the scutum is here, then male, significantly smaller, then nymphal state, and as you can see these larvae are really tight. Uh, I always question when, when there are dog owners that I, I, would, I don't want to put any poisonous substances on my dogs, I am excellent tick picker and I will find them every, I will perform tick picking twice per day and I will find every single one. But I think that these are rather challenging for everybody. Time. <clears throat> okay, then about Trippicephalus, brown dog tick. As I, uh, you saw from the map, it is Mediterranean species. But uh, at the same time, it's high tolerance for drought, so it doesn't mean this 80% moisture in the surroundings. <clears throat> So it resides in dogs. So I mean, this is the perfect Mediterranean condition for Rikisephalus, what we have in this particular room. Okay, uh, because it is living inside, you can find them during the winter time as well. So I mean, you should get worried if there is minus 20 degrees outside and you, you will find ticks on the dogs. Most probably it's not Ixodes, but there's a high probability it's Erythicephalus. And because it is inside, uh, usually, and it can, uh, the entire life cycle can be performed within, inside the houses, the ticks are usually very abundant. Because, I mean, usually it's a dog that brought it there, the dog is inside the house, so the host is there, you don't have to spend years in the grass. Uh, hoping that somebody is passing your, your grass and, uh, and then you can attack the, the host. So it's inside the house, so the dog is there, the people are there, so that it's easy for you to set up. <coughs> and quite often it is so that when you have this problem in, in your dog or in your house, you will find 10 tripicephalus from each, each uh, toe and then 30 from both years and so on. So you really have a lot of ticks. It's resembling a lot of Ixodes, but there are certain morphological features that can be used for different things. Can you... You have now a photo of the Rikisephalus family. This is again, this female, male, nymphal uh, stage and larval stage. Uh, do you see any morphological differences? When you have this picturesque photo that was there a couple of slides earlier. On, on photos we do look different. <laughs> Name one. Well, position of the legs. Okay, they are dead ones, so don't count on that. <laughs> <laughs> head maybe is more... More head. Yeah, that's right. This is really shorter, the mouth parts, and as you can see, probably this uh, this part of the head is a sort of uh, hexagonal shape, like this. So it is like this. And if, if you take this part of the head from Ixodes, it is really like this. That's a good one. Then it has eyes, they are here. Okay. So it doesn't have them. And then what is, what is typical, uh, uh, it, they are called festoons, but they are the, the, mar the back marking of the sheet. Uh, in Finnish it is piparka. Why do you have that kind of cookie? What? Peppercock. Yes. So it's typical for, for Rippicephalus. The XLS doesn't have it. So those 
as you can, it's really obvious here. So next time when you find ticks during the winter time and it is uh, really really cold outside, so keep that in your mind. Okay, the, the first cases we have had in Finland it was actually 1970 something, and nowadays we got a couple of cases without any traveling history. So that the dogs are really getting the infestation from when they are playing with other dogs in the dog park. So that is it's typically a three-horse tick, so all the stages need blood meal, but as, as I told you, it, it will happen inside the house. So there are some crevices and um, places to, where to hide, and where to lay eggs. And usually it is that when you... What is happening? This is blood meal, and then it is laying eggs, and then it's dying. But if you see in the same house or on the same dock, different stages, then the problem is there. And I mean, because they are parasites, are only this 4-5% of their lifetime, so they are here in the surroundings, so your house can be full of ticks. And I mean, I have seen cases where it's like arachnophobia type of houses, that if you are taking a blanket, you have hundreds and hundreds of ticks uh, under the blanket. And what, I mean, of course, you, if you have this kind of problem, you should treat the dogs, but that's not usually enough. You need somebody who is, who is really, there are usually these commercial people that are, that are good at, at disinfecting and, and doing that kind of thing inside of the house. But it's really difficult. Because and we had a case at a university hospital in Helsinki a couple of years ago. One of the vet nurses, it has a dog imported from Spain, those rescue dogs, and it got this infestation, and they suddenly noticed that we have a problem with the clinics. And I mean, it was a brand new clinic, uh, everything was clean, white, and with uh, the tiles, so it, it was sort of easy, easy case. <coughs> they emptied the room, the dogs were always in the same room, I emptied the room and then the cleaned And this commercial company was there three times before they got rid of, the, of this fix. <coughs> Although that was considered as an easy one. Okay. I can recall my first case in the Springer Spaniels. A uh, young uh, couple owning them. Both of them had many mites. And, and, uh, and then uh, they visited my practice again after. After two months, and, uh, and uh, we got, uh, then they said we got the solution. And uh, they said, I asked her, it's interesting to hear because, because uh, it's really a difficult one. And then they said it was a rental house, so we moved out. <laughs> <laughs> and that, actually, then there was one, one family where the father of the family said, if there were dogs that brought it in, dog has to leave. And dogs left, uh, what to do? Poor little ticks. Okay, they prefer rock dogs. They are even able to, to recognize the, the voices of dogs. But when they notice that the dogs are not here anymore, what to do? Of course, they have to start support from human beings. And usually adult human beings, are, we are, have to fix skin for their mouth, short mouth parts. But if they are lucky, they are babies and they are small kids. So the, the sources. Yeah. So keep that in your mind. And derma center, again, a morphological exercise. What are the differences between those previous two ones? Pattern. It's like pattern. Like leopard. This one. Yes. Yeah, this is really typical. This uh, marble or ornamentation. And uh, this is a female again. So this is uh, Ixodes doesn't have it, Ripicephalus doesn't have it. Okay, again, there are the, ma the head is of different shape. This is not hexagonal. But how about the festoons? Or what was it? The padlock. <laughs> the padlock, is it there? It is there, yes. 
So I mean, you can you can differentiate it easily from each other, but it is uh, then the other, it has the similar similar type of structures here than what we had in in uh, function. Okay, then a little bit about tick-borne diseases. First about sporelia. Uh, uh, they are spirochetes, as we all know, so this corkscrew type of bacteria. And uh, the problem from epi epidemiological point of view is really that there are a lot of uh, reservoirs in wildlife. So the infection is very common in rodents, in common, very common in birds, and it's very common in in wild mammals as well. So, I mean, the infection is there. And so, so we really can't control the infection by itself. Okay, we, we discussed about that there are some, some infective agents that are able to transmit from a female tick to X that is not possible for Porelia. The trans ovarial transmission doesn't occur, but of course, of epidemiological importance is that, that this transstadial transmission of the, so that from larva to, larva to, to nymph and the, from nymphal state to an adult tick. That's a typical situation. <coughs> okay, borreliosis in dogs, it's in tick rich regions, it's very common, common in dogs. So the, it seems that the dogs are very really easily get to inf infection. So infection is very common. But at the same time, the clinical disease is rare. So if the dog will get the borreliosis, probably it won't develop clinical signs. So this is uh, one study of the 70 in the region where 75% of the dogs were borrelia positive when they took a blood, blood sample and, and measured the antibodies against borrelia factor. But at the same time, clinical disease was present only in the 5 to 10 percent. And this is a rather challenging for vets as well. I know that in certain areas, Borrelia is underdiagnosed. This is, they have tick rich regions, and, and vets do not think that, that we don't have Borrelia in that region. But at the same time, it's overdiagnosed because you have a sort of untypical disease or clinical signs with your dogs, and then you will take some samples and you will find Borrelia. And then, oh, because case of Borrelia. But although there is a high probability that it is only zero positivity and the dog is suffering from something. <coughs> so the, the zero positivity is not a confirmation of clinical Borreliosis. That's very important to bear in mind. Okay, of course, there are individual variations in immunity. Some of the dogs are more sensitive and uh, some of the dogs are very resistant. And, and at the same time, it seems that there is variation in the virulence of Borrelia strains as well. Some Borrelia are more dangerous than the other. <clears throat> okay, when the Borrelia is there, it is it's obvious, seems to be obvious that it is able to cause a very persistent infection. So it has a lot of has, uh, tricks how to hide the immune system by the host. So uh, there are surface proteins and the Borrelia bacteria after certain period it is changing completely the surface proteins and then the immune system that have developed the immune reaction against surface protein it got lost because the proteins are not there anymore. There are spherical changes and, and, and many other ways to escape the immune attack by the host. Okay, and if clinical disease is present, it is usually because of the immune response. I mean, this Borrelia by itself is not really very nasty, I'm not able to do uh, a lot of harm in, in, in tissues. But of course, at the end, what matters is what the, what the body of the host is doing against Borrelia and the clinical signs are related to those reactions. <coughs> Okay, then, then there is a lot of autoimmunity involved as well. Uh, uh, we know that uh, some of the uh, Borrelia proteins are able to initiate the immune reaction against uh, neural tissue, and that will cause this neuroborreliosis. There is some debate about if Borrelia is really able to 
to enter the brain, for example. And uh, uh, it, it, there's a sort of slight consensus that it's not, that it's an immune reaction occurring there. Because there was borrelia uh, at the beginning, but, but then it's an autoimmune reaction against neuronal tissues. And similarly, uh, when borrelia is present, interleukin 8 production in synovial membranes is initiated, and that is causing this limping and signs um, of polyarthritis. Why is this borreliosis so difficult to diagnose in human beings? Because I, I know it's very very widely spread. In yes. Them. What what's the problem? I think it's the same problem that in dogs. That seropositivity is very very common, but you it's very difficult to decide if the patient is really suffering from clinical disease. Okay. So because there are not really good means okay. to show in, in, in that, that this is really the the cause of clinical disease. Okay, tricks are needed. Uh, there are some dog studies with, with laboratory cultured uh, Borrelia bacteria, and they have failed the experimental infection. So, big, big involvement is really needed. And good to know and remember that, uh, especially in experimental infections, uh, the incubation period is very long. So, usually, the clinical scenes won't be seen. Uh, not earlier than two to four months after infection. So, I mean, if your dog is getting sick after the, a couple of weeks after visiting the rich area, most probably it's not probably it's something else. Uh, this is typical that the dogs get sick and when the tick season is over, for example, you know. And when the clinical disease is present, the seroconversion is already there usually, so this antibody uh, measurement is okay. But again, what is the value of the, the seropositivity? That is, of course, under discussion. <coughs> okay, clinical signs high fever, limping, joint wellings, and then joint swellings are usually starting uh, from the joint that is nearest to the thick bite side. Lymphadenopathy, and again, usually the, the lymph node that is closest to the tick bite is the first one to react. Uh, losing uh, appetite and a sort of general, and uh, the is not doing very well. And what is typical as well, that the clinical signs will resolve after the treatment with antibiotics as in initiated. And then uh, rare clinical manifestations are kidney failure, seen especially in Bernese mountain dogs, uh, any type of uh, neurologic diseases. And what is very really typical for man is this, uh, it's called erythema migrants, so that you have uh, this, this erythematous uh, ring around the tick bite and it is widening all the time, day, by day, day after day. It is very common in man, but it's hardly never seen in dogs. Or if it's there, it is a sort of, let's say, uh, slight version of the reaction. And then these are immunological diseases that are associated with chronic Borrelia infection. <coughs> Diagnostic. Okay, you, of course you will take uh, blood samples and maybe some biological parameters, but they are not specific, so you can't really can perform the diagnosis based on that. Serology, as discussed already several times, it confirms the infection, but is confirming that we are really dealing with a true case of clinical borreliosis. And what is a sort of uh, how we should manage these cases? Having a typical clinical picture, the dog with tick bite history, efficacy of the treatment with antibiotics and plus seropositivity. Then we probably had a case of water. Okay, this treatment protocol I took it from New Greenies, that is by the way a very good book, Greenies Infectious Disease of the Dogs and Cats. Um, all the viruses and bacteria plus protozoa are there. And <coughs> rather long courses and then there is still discussion and that applies to human beings as well if the treatment 
of Borrelia lasting 30 days, one month, is enough to eliminate the bug from the, the body. And there's discuss, nobody really knows. Of course, and especially when we are dealing with dogs, we have a lot of good products uh, to protect our dogs against ticks. And, uh, and then there is discussion about the body's the role and uh, the benefit of, of vaccines here. And, and it seems that, that in many countries, uh, selling those vaccines is not easy because there are a lot of discussion and, and uh, let's say opinions by key opinion leaders if it's really worth of that or not. Borreliosis in cats. Uh, if you are, your cat is uh, roaming in tick rich area, probably it will get the infe infection at some stage. But although seropositivity is rather common or it's not rare, clinical disease has not been described. So if you diagnose a Borrelia case in cat, please publish it. But probably you will find some problems by the reviewers because. Because of course they will question how did you how do you end it up that or find out that person sure you had your case of coronavirus in case. Okay, then anaplasmosis. Uh, at least in Finland it's more common than Borrelia is. And uh, the name of the disease is canine granulocytic anaplasmosis. And it was uh, in all the times it was referred as as uh, Granulocytic erythiosis. So a couple of years ago they changed it. The, the nomenclature a little bit, and now it's anaplasmosis. Okay, there are still erythia, but it's a different, different bacteria. The, the one that is present in our country is anaplasmosis. Caused by anaplasma phagocytophilum, it's gram-negative aerob intracellular bacteria that resides in neutrophil, uh, preferably in mature neutrophil granulocytes. Okay, usually uh, it requires about, we discussed during the, the ticks that, that usually it needs a certain period to prepare the blood meal. And during that time it's quite often that the uh, uh, infection does not transmit from the tick to the host. So there's a, we call it grace period because the risk for the infection is very low at that time. And what comes to anaplasmosis, it is usually from one day to two days. It can be a couple of hours as well if you are unlucky, but typical cases from one day to two days. Uh, incubation period, usually significantly shorter than with borreliosis, from one to two weeks. And uh, it lies really inflammatory cells of granulocytic lineage, so it can infect eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils, but has really high preference on neutrophilic granulocytes. And they are able to detect this, this receptor on the surface of the, of the granulocytes, and, and so they recognize their, their favorite cell in the body system. <coughs> so they will add us on the receptor, and then it, it, uh, the neutrophil will sort of eat the bacteria and that allows them to, to enter those phacosome vacuoles in neutrophils. And of course, uh, the immune system, the idea is really that now I will keep the, kill the anaplasma within the neutrophils, but, but that doesn't happen in, in real life. So, so actually these are multiplied within the neutrophilic granulocytes. Clinical anaplasmosis is non-specific generalized disease. They have fever, a little bit less than in case of Borrelia, lethargy, anorexia. So 75% of the growth. 75 of the dogs suffering from clinical anaplasmosis, they show these clinical signs. But then they are a little bit... Uh, um, other clinical signs that we see more, not that commonly, and they are musculoskeletal pain, limping, stiffness, and pain in joint. And then all these clinical signs can be seen, but although they are rare in canine anaplasmosis. Diagnostics season, we are in the middle of peak season, when these clinical diseases occur. 
bit by bit history, and then of course the first thing to do is to, to, to make a blood smear, uh, like we are doing when you are doing the, the white cell difference in ASIN count, and you will especially monitor neosophilic granulocytes because this anaplasma morulus can be seen in 37% of the neosophilis. Usually there is concurrent thrombocytopenia and lymphopenia and eosinophilia and uh, at the same time although the neutrophils are infected the neutrophil count remains normal so, so, so there won't be any neutropenia. And about a little bit less than 50% they will have anemia at the same time. Serology is available as well, and uh, probably you are dealing with those SNAP tests where you have all tick-borne diseases in the same, same test, uh, and actually uh, those combo infections with Borrelia plus anaplasmosis, they are not that rare. And PCR is available for, for certain labs. Treatment. Uh, it's really tetracyclines, and that's why, although that in the case of Borrelia, there were several other options as well, but it's quite often that, that you are having seropositivity for both anaplasma and Borrelia, so doxycycline, tetracycline is quite often the, the preferred treatment against tick-borne diseases. And what is typical in canine anaplasmosis is that that efficacy of the treatment will be seen in, in <coughs> one or two days. So it's a good, good sign. And then tick-borne encephalitis caused by flavivirus, and uh, it seems that uh, dogs get uh, infection rather easily, but again, it seems that they are very resistant against clinical disease. We have had one clinical case in Finland, and, uh, and that is a sort of how it goes in the real life. So, but if you, the dog will get the clinical tick-borne encephalitis, probably the dog will be dead by the end of the treatment. So, so it's a nasty disease. And what we know about the transmission time for tick-borne tick -borne encephalitis, we know from human being cases that, that it's, it is actually the only uh, tick-borne uh, pathogen that can transmit very rapidly within, even there are some references, that within minutes. So um, uh, as soon as the tick is uh, attaching the skin, there is a risk of tick-borne encephalitis. But luckily enough, the dogs are resistant to that disease. Okay, and you said that you don't have canine babesiosis cases, uh, and that is because you don't have dermacenter, which is sort of the most important tick species for transmitting canine babesiosis, babesia canis, in Europe, but as soon as you will get a tick, you will get this disease as well. Um, again, peripheral. Well, we already have the disease, but not local. I mean, okay. the ones coming from. Well, uh, visiting southern uh, European countries, or uh, for example, going to Ukraine or Europe. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, what, what is seen quite often that uh, when you have canine papesiosis, you will find still find the ticks of the dogs as well. Because I, I took those those dermacenter pictures what I had here from the clinical case of papesia. So, so this really. Really nasty disease. Okay, and now we have another part. Of it. Questions? Yes. Is there any particular amount of time that a tick can be on the skin or like eating before uh, the dog will have a uh, uh, It is. Um, I have it in my next presentation, but it is usually two days, and the world record is 17 hours. 16 point something. So if you get uh, rid of the tick before that 17 hours, yes. you will not have any. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so Borrelia is very 
strongly bonded to this dermal sensor. So let's say Xodes Vincinum is. No, Borrelia yeah, is Xodes. Yeah, so and the is, is, yeah, so yeah. we are sticking so to our species. species. Yes, our teach species aren't able to transfer. Uh -huh. So it's funny, but it's, it's a real. Okay, let's have some coffee. <laughs>